You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman. The woman is talking to the man regarding a job in a hotel. You have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. The conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Vela Hotel. How can I help you? Hello. I read about your advertisement in the midday news. Yes, we have given more than one advertisement. Is that advertisement related to housekeeping staff? The advertisement in the newspaper is related to housekeeping staff. So, housekeeping staff is written as an answer for the example. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning, Vela Hotel. How can I help you? Hello. I read about your advertisement in the midday news. Yes, we have given more than one advertisement. Is that advertisement related to housekeeping staff? Right. I'm interested in the cleaning department. Great. Actually, I'm not dealing in this department. The person who is taking care of this department is not available today. Still, I can help you by giving you the basic details if you're interested. Oh, that will be great. What kind of staff are you looking for? The staff that we are looking for includes laundry, shoe polishing facilities, keeping the building clean, sweeping, mopping, dusting, vacuum cleaning and bathroom cleaning. Housekeeping staff also clean the windows and public areas and remove trash and deposit it into the building dumpsters. Absolutely right. Can you tell me the working hours? We have four shifts. Early morning shift from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m., morning shift from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., evening shift from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., and night shift from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. So do you give the option to the people of choosing the shift timings? Actually, we do not encourage that. The reason is that everybody would choose the shift according to their preference, but we do allow replacing one week's shift with another shift timing. I think it would be better if I note all this down. Also, can you tell me about the day off system? We offer two days off and you can change the days on every alternative week of the month. Can you please tell me regarding the payment system? Absolutely, just a moment. Yes, I have them. You get $8 per hour, which includes your break. Will I get meals or...? Yes, we offer meals to all our staff and there is no charge for it, which is a big relief. Awesome! Also, you'll be happy to know that you also get tips from our bona fide guests. What about the uniform? Is there any uniform system? I mean, do you provide the clothes as a uniform? Of course! It slipped out of my mind. We do provide clothes for the uniform. Wow, that is good! As it is difficult for one to manage one's uniform, what is the colour of the uniform? Green shirt and cream trousers, no prints, just plain. Oh, I forgot to ask about the date. From when can I join? Uh, can you hold for a minute? You can join from the first week of next month. You know the weather is improving. Perfect. I'm free from next month. Great. But I would like to inform you that you have to call again and speak with Miss Samantha Bradshaw as she's the manager who is dealing with housekeeping department. She'll guide you as to when you come for the interaction with the manager. Not a problem. What time should I call again? You can call her after two days, as on that day she'll have time to interact with you. So shall I call back on the same number? No, I'll give you her number. The number is plus zero four four eight 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 three 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 five three eight five. OK, I will call her. Do tell her about all information which I've given you, and also you'll be asked some verification questions. Not a problem. 
Thank you very much. You are most welcome. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Besley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now, the castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost, so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off and it will also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens. If you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There is a lot of history steeped in those walls. As you leave the castle via the South Bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Admission to the grounds is free for all. That includes the museum, gardens and picnic area. There is an admission fee for the castle, which is £6.50 for adults, with a 10% discount for students and retired people. Children under the age of 16 pay half adult price and under 8 go in free. There are many spectacular events throughout the year, and for most of them, there's also an admission fee. As these events are in high demand, it's a good idea to book well in advance. Some of the exciting events planned for this year are the Summer Medieval Festival, where you can watch old-fashioned nights and experience a feast in the halls of the castle, as if you were a guest of King Henry VIII himself. There are several concerts planned this year too, including a rock concert, 
at an admission price of ten pounds per person and a special jazz concert which is free to the public. I'm sure you'll agree that all tastes and ages will be satisfied. One scary but extremely popular event is the annual haunted castle event at the end of October, where the castle comes alive at night. Why don't you come along if you're brave enough? Another sight to see is the fantastic firework display on November fifth, and the cost of that includes refreshments. We also have a long tradition of raising money for charity. The charity event held every year on the first day of May will this year be an archery contest. Entrance is free, but donations are certainly welcome. This year. We'll be collecting money on behalf of a charity for elderly people, age concern. Just in case you can't remember all of that, you can pick up a leaflet showing the timetable and prices for all events from the tourist information desk. You can also go online to get this information from our website. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three on page six of your listening booklet. Section three. You will hear two students called Richard and Shirley discussing the information they have collected so far for a group project. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions twenty-one to thirty. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to thirty. Hi, Shirley. Glad you could meet me at the weekend to talk about the research we have to do on energy. Yes, Richard. I think it's important that we stay focused on the specific area of our research: energy consumption. Did you know that the demand for electricity is growing faster than coal, oil, and gas can supply it? Yes, indeed. Coal and oil, which I discovered are also known as fossil fuels. Could have disastrous effects on world climate. My research supports you. I also found out that the weather could be affected by global warming. However, a range of fuels are used around the world. Did you know that the most common fuels are the fossil fuels, with oil accounting for almost half at forty-five percent. Coal and natural gas are equal next at twenty percent, with nuclear power being the lowest at seven percent. Other sources of energy are also near the bottom at eight percent. Before the final part of the conversation, you now have twenty seconds to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. That information will be useful when we look at the different energy sources in detail. We also need to look at the pros and cons of each type of energy. We've already said that fossil fuels increase the world's temperature, but we also need to mention the most serious issue: that these three types of fuel are finite, meaning they will not last forever. Another major disadvantage is that by burning coal and oil in particular, chemicals are released into the atmosphere. Which combine with water to fall back to Earth and damage both plant and animal life. That really sounds useful. If you focus on coal, oil, and gas, I'll look into nuclear power. 
It is common knowledge that nuclear power stations create radioactive waste, but I'm particularly interested in how this unwanted waste product is dealt with safely. I'll also need to look at the effects on people living near these power stations. Yes, I think all those areas need exploring. Do you think I should also look into renewable energy sources, such as wind and sun, energy that never runs out? Don't you think it's an important area to consider? Yes, but I don't think I'll have enough time to look at it in enough detail. I also agree that we have enough to focus on until our next group meeting. So to finish, you could find some information on the advantages of fossil fuels, and I'll give you the facts that I have already on coal, oil, and gas. We don't need to look into other energy sources because I'll get more details on the nuclear industry. That's great. See you in two weeks' time. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 44. Section 4. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 44 and 45. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well... Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. 
For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard, and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So, in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So that's a very different story from the early research. So what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.